Welcome to this expert interview with Dr. Kaspar Rekowek. He is a, a fellow um, at the Center for Research on Extremism at the University of Oslo. He's been studying terrorism for years, terrorism, counterterrorism, uh, also countering extremism at various academic institutions uh, in Northern Ireland, um, uh, Queen's University in Belfast, but also at St. Andrews. He's uh, worked for uh, several think tanks uh, in Germany and in Poland, and he was also uh, working uh, in the private sector at uh, Globsec in Bratislava, Slovak Republic. He originally started as a, a researcher on terrorism in Europe in general, with a, a focus on the situation in Northern Ireland, uh, mainly the IRA. And since 2011, his focus uh, of research shifted more towards global jihadism, also um, uh, jihadi foreign fighters. Uh, but since 2014, he has been studying uh, the phenomenon of foreign fighters that uh, went, Western foreign fighters that went to the Ukraine. And from January 2020, um, he has been conducting research in the, into the pre-war lives of those people that uh, joined uh, the fight in the Ukraine, uh, which is supported by the counter extremism project. Uh, Dr. Rekorek, thank you for joining us to discuss uh, your latest publication, your latest book, uh, Foreign Fighters in Ukraine. Uh, thank you. Brown Red Cocktail. So. I'm very interested in this. It, it, this book came out um, uh, after the invasion by Russia in, in February 2022. Of course, the war started, you could say, in, 19, uh, in 2014. Um, so, but you started this project already uh, years ago. So why? Why? Because you have a focus on, on terrorism, foreign fighters, uh, and you started this when this phenomenon was relatively small um, a couple of years ago so what 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 uh, why were you so interested in that yes edwin thank you for having me uh, it's a pleasure and i'll briefly tell you i mean there's a story behind it so in the summer of 2014 i was working as a counterterrorism analyst at a think tank in poland uh, polish institute of international affairs and literally i was having lunch uh, upstairs we have like a attic and sometimes the tv would play some news and someone switched it to Russia Today, which we kind of, you know, laughingly sometimes watch to basically amuse ourselves. And Russia Today on that very day in August uh, 2014 had a piece on Frenchmen fighting on the side of the what was called the separatists, mm -hmm. effectively Russia. And I remember eating my lunch and thinking, oh, you know, this is crazy. Why would you go? Uh, you're comfortably in Western Europe and why would you go and fight for Russia? And after a few seconds, it hit me, you know, I fell off my chair thinking, okay, these guys are foreign fighters. All my colleagues from all around the world are studying foreign fighters. But, you know, I was in this horrible situation that there were, there were hardly any going from my part of Europe uh, to join ISIS. And suddenly I felt like, right, you know, foreign fighters were the cool thing to do research-wise, mm -hmm. and I had none. Uh, and suddenly I found a group that would allow me to stand out. And, you know, the rest is history, but you're right. This was a relatively small phenomenon, and I had to do other things in the in the meantime to simply feed myself and my family. Uh, but I came back to this uh, in 2019, 2020. Was writing this book that thank you for 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 showcasing this one here today. And obviously, things got a bit more speedy in February 2022, as there were there is a new class of foreign fighters coming into the conflict, uh, different from the class of 2014, if you like. And I somehow had to put it into one book and probably I'll write another one on the 2022-2023 situation. So that's that's the story. And it's, it's, it's called the Brown Red uh, Cocktail. Um, uh, maybe you could explain. So you, the yeah. initial pictures were of Frenchmen fighting for, well, you could say the Reds, uh, the, 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 the uh, separatist uh, republics uh not recognized uh, of course um but, but this brown red so when you start started digging into this uh, phenomenon um could you say a, a little bit about the size or the background of these people so it's not just those that joined the uh, separate republics but also others sure uh it's basically you know the correct po political science term should be red brown and that signifies people who would be on the right but would have leftist thoughts 
or people who are on the far left who have some, you know, far right thoughts. And, you know, this horseshoe theory, they meet at the end, uh, at the at the both ends of the horseshoe. But this isn't about such people. It's about brown recruits for either side, meaning from the far right, going either to join the Ukrainian volunteer battalions or the separatist militias, or the red recruits who are joining the separatists, thinking that they're fighting for, you know, for a kind, some kind of a rejuvenated Soviet Union. Because remember, these are called Donetsk People's Republic, Luhansk People's Republic. That's that that's the name. So, effectively, you're looking at a few hundred people uh, who went to fight on both sides. Actually, from the west, uh, effectively, more came to fight on the Russian side. And then the funny thing happened that they did not mind firing at one another, even though they had known each other from before the war, and they often were coming from the same milieu. So you effectively had far right guys uh, fighting with each other, uh, and somewhere in the fields of eastern eastern Ukraine, very shallow in terms of like you know the motivation of these individuals, the ideological motivation, because at some points and in certain cases it was almost like a coin toss, who I'm going to join. And in certain cases, for example, the visa decided, you know, you had to get a visa to get to Russia, to get to the separatists. You could get to Ukraine without the visa. Therefore, hey, I go to fight for the Ukrainians. It was it was remarkable, especially when I saw the how they greeted each other in, you know, on social media. Social media right. They would say, hey, I see you. You're there. I'm here. But, you know, meet, let's meet in Valhalla and let's see who's better. Literally like this, a whole culture develops and obviously you know the big difference with the jihadi uh cases that you would know very well yourself had been that it's legal you know it is legal to go and fight in a foreign war if you're not joining a terrorist or terrorist organization or a proscribed organization none of them were joining such organizations therefore they could organize online they could travel they could come back and expect no harm uh, upon their return so a fascinating you know, a fascinating case, I would say, in the middle yeah, of the... For, for a scholar, because then you can uh, interact with them. Of course, that's different today with those who joined IS, uh, to, to be sure uh, that, that sure. both are considered terrorists uh, these days. But initially, it was very much the same. Do you see striking differences if you look at the body of, of, of knowledge about um, uh, jihadist foreign fighters and, and your case? Could you maybe mention one or two things that are very similar and maybe one or two things that are very different? Uh, so what can we learn, those that are interested in the phenomenon of foreign fighters in general, from your book? I would say, Edwin, the 2014 class of people who went to fight on either side, in a sense, they resembled the ISIS crowd or the crowd that evolved towards ISIS fighters. Uh, they resembled this in a sense that they're both coming from the kind of anti-systemic milieu. You know, they're not rejects or criminals at all, but I'm trying to say that they don't fit in. They don't like the world that it's around them. So, you know, the guys that I studied, if you're on the far right and you feel that the society is out to get you or does not give you the chance to speak about what you would like to speak and you, you're drowning in this political correctness, as they would say, then yeah, they are partly you know in between a reject and someone who simply looks for other things uh, in life. So this is the 2014 crowd. Now we have to just understand. We just have to understand that it changes. You know, the red, brown, brown, red mobilization is the one of 2014. The one in 2022, 23, they're different. They're different from the previous lot because they're mostly former soldiers. You know, they see it as a clean, good versus evil type of a fight. They predominantly join Ukraine in 2022, and they're saying, I'm, I'm here to do my job. You know, I have some experience, and I will now use this experience to help Ukraine. Whereas eight, nine years later, it wasn't about experience in helping Ukraine. It was about my lack of experience, but an opportunity to gain it. You know, here's a war. I always wanted to be in war. We don't know when the next one's going to be in Europe. So let's go for this one. That's the difference, you know, how they're how they're changing, how these mobiliza mobilizations change. And obviously, you know, these things, both in 2014, but especially now, they're done openly. You know, the recruitment, the logistics, the travel, it's all done openly. You know, I know about this. I can talk to people involved in all stages of this. Whereas I guess in the, ca in the case, if you're joining, especially a jihadi or an Islamist organiz organization, that quite quickly turned into a, you know, a no-no, an illegal or a kind of like an underground type of, an, type of an operation. Plus, you know, this is closer. You know, I think mentally throughout the last decade or so, we always felt that places such as Damascus 
are closer to us than Donetsk, but geographically, Donetsk mm -hmm. is closer. You know, this is the, this reali realization hits you once you see this, but it is also an interesting source of, you know, some interesting travails of these fighters who for the first time in their lives, they need to get to Central Eastern Europe. And really, you know, some of the conversations that I'm having with them and that I'm seeing, they're really, it's a cultural gulf that is there, which I'm sure was also for other foreign fighters from, I guess, any any conflict. And maybe to round it off, the main similarity for, I would say, all the foreign fighters for any conflict is that the trigger for them to go, in my view, is quite often the same, you know, very often is the same. So you see audiovisual images of women and children, civilians suffering. And you empathize with them because, you know, they're your co-religionists, co they are, they look like you, I don't know, they speak your language, whatever. And in certain cases, certain individuals decide, decide to go. So I think the trigger is very much always, always, always the same. Well, thank you, Kasper. Thank you for sharing your, your insights. This is ongoing research. Uh, so I'm also very interested what you're going to publish um, in the coming, um, well, this year and the coming years, because unfortunately, this conflict is still ongoing. Indeed. So thank you very much for those at home. If you're interested in uh, the work of Kasper, uh, we will provide you with uh, a number of publications and we highly recommend the latest book uh, on foreign fighters in Ukraine, the brown-red cocktail. Thank you so much. Thank you, Edwin.